Wing Commander Ben Cullen has an air mobility background and has served in a variety of roles as a navigator, now ACO, an instructor, a flight commander, and in project roles. He is currently the CO of 29 Squadron and also holds a position as Comask for Op Sudden Discovery, which is why he's here with us today. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Well, thank you, uh, Claire, for inviting me here today uh, to talk to the audience here at both at Anglesey Barracks and those who have joined across the country via uh, the code webinar. Uh, Honoured that you uh, consider uh, me to come and actually have a talk about my thoughts and observations on our current operations in Antarctica. I think we've uh, come a long way, I think, if we've got an Air Force officer addressing an Army PME forum uh, about a non-combat operation in a, an area of operations that doesn't make it onto many of our maps, so that's uh, quite encouraging. Uh, I've been an active participant, obviously, in the CO program here at Anxley Barracks in uh, what we call fireside chats. Uh, both the senior naval officer and myself have attended many of those, and I think we've created some really good balanced discussions and uh, learnt a lot of our individual capabilities amongst each of the respective domains that make up a stronger purple one. So I think that's a real good thing. Uh, I've been asked today to talk about Op Southern Discovery, which uh, is uh, probably a lesser known uh, operation in the big scheme of things. Um, the title is a, a JFAO like no other, and uh, so it's selected carefully for a wide variety of reasons, hopefully of which you will get a grasp of as we move along through it. So without any further ado, I'll, I'll start off. Firstly, uh, don't be fooled by the magnificent picture you have in front of you. Um, if you walk away from this presentation believing um, uh, that that's an 8 8 blue every day down there um, with an endless beauty of landscape viewed from a light turboprop aeroplane, uh, I will have completely failed you. So just keep that in mind. Um, some other things, I'm not a logistician in terms of rule engagement. Uh, I'm an operator, but I do embrace the philosophy that logistics runs the war, uh, and I've had Burnt fingers, as uh, to prove it. I have vested interest, obviously, as Comas, to make sure our logistics system works, like any other commander out there. Uh, otherwise, the battle is already lost. But uh, I have been disappointed enough in the past, so keep that in mind. Now, when I say our, I mean the Australian Antarctic Program's logistics system. Uh, this program is all about uh, our logistics underpinning operations, which enables science. Uh, you need to really keep grasp with that theme as we go throughout the presentation today. As Claire alluded to, I, I have been an integral part of our ADF logistics system in the past, having flown uh, in Air Force Air Mobility since 1996. So I've seen the span of Timor uh, all the way through our 16 year presence in the Middle East. Uh, seen a lot of systems work and I've seen a lot of systems not work in the Airbridge space and uh, intra theater operations. For you as an Army PME Forum, as the masters of the land domain, as I see you, uh, understanding air power is uh, a really important theme here, as there's a heavy reliance in this particular theatre on aviation. So thinking about those concepts of, of those characteristics of reach, speed, impermanence, um, and especially so, not so much fragility of uh, platforms, but sensitivity to factors such as weather. Uh, and conditions and what other elements we have under so underpinning the operation down there. Now, air power, as you all, all should know, is a two-edged sword. So keep that in mind. So the first question I think we all need to ask ourselves is um, uh, why do we even bother? Uh, why do we bother messing in Antarctica? An icy, desolate continent some 2,000 kilometres south of us in terms of viability, first we've got to cross thousands of kilometres of the world's stormiest ocean, uh, navigate through a formidable ice barrier surrounding the place where we live and work for extended periods in the coldest, driest, windiest continent on the planet. Uh, that really doesn't sound like a good time to me. Uh, however, there are seven prime uh, reasons from our capstone doctrine. First one is to maintain freedom from strategic and or political confrontation, and we'll have a, we'll have a talk about that later. Preserving the sovereignty of the Australian Antarctic Territory, which is, as you'll find out, 42% of the continent down there. And we're going to have a real close look at that word sovereignty later on. Supporting a strong and effective Antarctic treaty system, uh, which is the keystone of Australia's strategic position in the region. Uh, to take advantage uh, of opportunities for scientific research, which is truly the currency of the continent. Protecting the environment. 
So I'm talking about there from the perils of contamination by us conducting operations down there, or even the impacts of Antarctic tourism. Also, to be informed and able to influence developments in the region, and that means to have a seat at that table within the Antarctic Treaty System, uh, deriving economic benefits or reasonable economic benefits, uh, excluding mining and oil drilling, of course, uh, but you'll find that fisheries is a big part of this. So the first question we need to ask ourselves is how did we actually get here? Well, it all probably started back uh, in the 1800s, but really the rubber hit the road in 1911 with Mawson uh, making a first expedition to the continent. Some 18 years later, um, the British, Australian and New Zealand Antarctic Research Expedition commenced its uh, operations. Um, and in actual 1933, um, what was then a British claim was handed to us uh, by the Brits. Um, in 1947, the Australian National Antarctic Research Expedition commenced and um, some one year later in 1948, the Australian Antarctic Division as an entity became uh, in being. Uh, over the next 10 years, they were fairly busy uh, building three stations. We had uh, Air Force first committing uh, in the late uh, 50s, early 60s to conducting uh, DC-3 and Beaver operations in an intracontinental air operation and of course in 1961 after everyone had served the table uh, the original treaty was signed so 12 original nations uh, seven actually made claims others are reserving rights in other areas of course since then we've had uh, as an ADF we've had a uh, continued long engagement we've had uh, 1970s we had obviously uh, the army conducting uh, lark operations in support of the program uh, we had throughout the time period we've had uh, Navy uh, offering logistic solutions and uh, most recently um, Army and Navy have had uh, service level agreements conducting both hydrography and survey operations in the theatre. Now that was before it became a jock operation of course. So what have we done in recent times? Um, well since the uh, start of Ops Southern Discovery we, we've Pretty much gone along the lines of having uh, that survey work continuing uh, through six brigade personnel, a hydrographic survey through the Navy uh, Hydrographic and Meteorological Group, uh, and we've also been offered up uh, offering up leadership positions down there to fulfil the station leader roles. What do we offer now, right now, through Ops Southern Discovery? Well, we're two seasons in now, and primarily it's niche capabilities. So the one that you'd probably be more or quite well publicised is that of uh, offering airlift through C-17A aircraft. Obviously that owes, uh, offers an air logistic capability that really blows the minds of most of the AAD staff and it's really created a lot of, uh, a lot of great uh, options uh, have opened up to, in the program. Now both the Australians, us and the United States use the capability of the C-17 and larger aircraft in the, in the case of the United States. Um, for delivery of that oversized cargo to the continent. And obviously the rapid return of science projects back if they are time critical. Uh, at the same time, we're also offering up, uh, supplementing the Bureau of Meteorology and their contribution to the program by using our own Naval Meteorological Geospatial Officers. And of course we have those niche capabilities of hydrography and geospatial that are ongoing. Uh, in the leadership area, um, currently we have uh, one uh, Navy 05 uh, in a leadership role as a station leader on the continent. Uh, in the open, in open employment market, there are probably few organisations that train its leaders to take small teams and work with limited support uh, in remote environments. So that's pretty much our bread and butter. So we offer up a good uh, option there for the Australian Antarctic program. We also have national SAR standing commitments uh, in support of AMSA, and of course our ongoing response to any national crisis or emergency remains uh, intact in terms of a uh, whole of government uh, approach. So let's just have a quick talk about what we have to claim uh, on the continent and some of the regulatory constraints in what we can and can't do under the current treaty. Firstly, uh, amongst the 12 original nations that treaty in 1961, like I said, seven were claimants, and we bit off 42%. So uh, 
to guide your eyes there between around about the 130 position uh, right through to the 430 position a small gap and then uh, through to about the 530 position is our claim it's there delineated by a green line with a small uh, wedge of the French uh, in the middle there it's about the size of Australia less Queensland that that area um, so it's not small and um, of note obviously this claim was uh, all actually made by the UK in 1841 and then expanded and also as they transferred us to us in the early 30s a real quick geography lesson here and uh, just to point out some of the major areas uh, that I'll discuss today and to understand so there's, there's a major mountain range you can see there it starts from the Antarctic Peninsula around about the 1030 position and runs all the way through uh, the center of the clock for one of a better term down to about the 530 position. Now that actually separates two distinct areas, uh, West Antarctica and East Antarctica. Uh, obviously East Antarctica being the largest one. Uh, most of our, obviously all, all of our, the Australian Antarctic Territory uh, exists in East Antarctica there. And, and some of the areas of note um, that you should be well aware of is Princess Elizabeth Land. You'll see that at around about the 230 position and it extends uh, predominantly all the way inland. Another point uh, uh, area to note there is uh, the wedge. You probably saw it on the previous slide. We'll go back to it in the next one, um, which is an area down around uh, Commonwealth Bay at around about the 430 position. The other place of note there, which we'll talk about later, is Dome Argus. And you can see that at around about the 230 position and around about the 80 degrees south position. Now that is the highest point on the continent. In terms of the whole geography itself, um, Antarctica is really a large, uh, oh, a thick layer of ice that uh, over, overlaps um, uh, actual land and it's continually sliding down the hill out to the ocean. So you can sort of imagine it in a constant state of, of, of that sort of action uh, as it moves off uh, the continent and out to sea. Just going back to that original map, um, what do we actually got under the management of the Australian Antarctic Division uh, to meet the program aims? We have a sub-Antarctic station at Macquarie Island, and you can't actually see that, but Macquarie Island is some 700 uh, miles uh, south uh, east of Tasmania. We've also got uh, Heard and McDonald Island, and for those of you familiar with that uh, geography, that's well, well far to the south uh, west of Perth. Actually on the continent itself, we have three major stations. So that's Casey in Wilkes Land. And Casey you can see there at around about the four o'clock position. You've got Davis, which sits at around about the 2.30 position uh, amongst a whole bunch of other stations, which we'll talk about in a little while. And then we've got Mawson, which is situated up in Kemp land. So it's around about the two o'clock position on the coastline. Now we also have a seasonal intercontinental, intercontinental airfield, Wilkins. That's a 10,000 foot runway for the aviators out there listening. And it's around about 68 kilometers from Casey. And yes, that is 68 kilometers, no road, just over snow. There's also a historical site down in the wedge at Commonwealth Bay where the original Mawson's hut is located. We also have a couple of out camps that we maintain in order to project science uh, operations uh, into the continent. Now, as you'll see, there are plenty of other black dots spattered around our claim, and those black dots represent stations of other nations and our own. If you look at the Norwegian claim at the 12 o'clock, there are a few, uh, many more other nations, and the same, same with the Kiwis down the bottom in around that uh, five o'clock to seven o'clock type region. You will also note that neither the United States or Russia have any claim in there, or China for that matter. Whilst the first two countries were initial signatories to the treaty, they did not make any claims at the time of signature, but reserved the right to make claims later on. Now, here's the interesting thing about this term sovereignty in the context of Antarctica. Forget the concept of, hey, you're on my turf, get off. It actually doesn't work that way. In actual fact, when the treaty came into force in 1961, the Article 4 provisions did not denounce or diminish the claims of the seven claimants, but it also doesn't pre prejudice 
uh, the position of parties in their recognition or non-recognition of sovereignty. All said and done, only the United, New Zealand, United Kingdom, France and Norway actually recognise our claim. So you won't see any, any of them parked in the AAT, but it explains why there's so much other real estate now claimed by other nations. And how far does that sovereignty issue extend into the management of issues such as the EEZ and the Territorial Sea? Well, this is one of the uh, one of the one of the things that constantly keeps my mind boggled. But uh, the, the policy advisor uh, always assures me it's all in good all, all in good hands. So I'll just have a quick chat about some other interesting parts of the treaty for those who haven't read it. So the treaty is all about getting along with each other and advancing science. And that is quite noble, given it probably doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. What is the key to understanding is how you gain credibility in this type of environment. You need to understand the currency of the place. The currency of Antarctica is science. So the KPIs are not uh, boots on the ground, missions conducted, tons of cargo moved, uh, land space which has been reclaimed, uh, military effects met, none of that. It's more along the lines of number of papers written and produced, the scientific media that is produced and returned north for further research. Large science programs supported and that's how you actually get a voice at any treaty discussion. Now, the ADF have the ability with our capabilities and logistic systems to help out or supplement the Australian Antarctic Division in the program. But there are aspects of our military involvement, uh, well, but there are aspects that affect what we can and can't do in a military context. So the first term you really have to grasp is that of militarization. So what is military or militarization in the context of Article 1 of the treaty? Well, weapons use is a pretty obvious one. Establishment of camps, I'm guessing that's off the table. Weapons testing, certainly a no-no. Uh, but they're all fairly obvious. What about air to air refueling uh, to enable science? I mean, is that military activity? It's still up for debate. The use of military grade drones. There's lots of drones operating down there. The question is are they scientific drones or are they military drones? Again, to enable science. You've got to ask the question of are they off the table? The line is very grey and certainly perceived differently by many countries. And I'll let you think about that how you will. How is that differentiated from the logistic support that we offer another government department? Let's use DFAT, for example, in an overseas HADA type situation. I mean, we might want to offer up air to air fueling to extend our range or reach to meet an effect in a humanitarian assistance effect. Hopefully, uh, some of you have had a chance to pre read some of the articles in this presentation, and a lot of the focus is on that term of militarisation. You've got to keep in mind that. Antarctica is a prime spot for satellite communications or control stations of things like GPS or GLONASS type networks. Very little RF interference. Given the duality of purpose of these installations, does the establishment of these sort of facilities indicate a military posture by other nations? What would our actions be to deny the use of these types of facilities in Antarctica in the Antarctic Treaty context? These are some of the unanswered questions that I'm often having with my uh, counterparts down at Antarctic Division. We are not the only nation with military personnel and assets down there. Just about all countries do. Now, the US are very much like us. Uh, they predominantly provide a logistics function through Operation Deep Freeze. Hopefully many of you have seen pictures or videos as such. And they run logistics support to the National Science Foundation through Coast Guard icebreakers, use of C-17 or C-5 mark in an intercontinental air bridge type operation. And they also operate LC-130s in an intracontinental air bridge type operation. Japanese have an icebreaker down there, completely a Japanese self-defense vessel with a Japanese self-defense crew. The last rob is a French naval, not French naval vessel, it's a French vessel, but it has a completely French naval crew. And uh, we have quite a bit of interaction with those, those particular crew uh, when they come into Hobart. So in recent times, our focus and resource apportionment has been diverted elsewhere. I'm pretty sure you'll all be aware of that. And it makes it difficult to keep pace with other nations operating in the continent. Some nations are really starting to ramp up operations in the region. 
and the Russians and Chinese especially so. Now, there's no point in laying claim or taking responsibility for anything unless you continue to devote effort to its management, or continue to map it, continue to map the ocean floors, or continue to invest in infrastructure to support its upkeep. It's the old saying of use it or lose it. Now, in 1947, with the establishment of the Australian National Antarctic Research Expedition, we primarily had an interest in maintaining that scientific research and exploration posture. So we went hammer and tong in that period between 48 and 1960 to establish those three stations. And within the next 10 years or so, uh, so in, the, in, the, in the hope that when it came to treaty signature, we would have a main seat at the table. Other nations now identify what is available in natural resources on the continent, which at the time they were not really commercially viable. But given there is a resource squeeze coming up, maybe that will be a source of contention. And you could argue that many countries looking forward to future constraints to natural resources will be looking to Antarctica and maybe in that food area especially. Firstly, let's have a quick look at China and what they've achieved down there. Now, I want to remind everyone out there, and it should come at no, no surprise, just remind yourself of how really quickly and fast this country can do things. Super industrious, and you've all seen that and observed it in the recent past with the South China Sea, uh, how, how quickly they turn nothing into something. So in 1985, they established their first station, uh, Great Wall, which was all the way over in West Antarctica. So you can remember that from that initial picture, sort of sitting around underneath Chile. Then in 1989, they had Zhongshan established, that was four years later, and um, that's only 100 kilometres southwest of Davis Station. And you can probably remember that, recall Davis being in that area called Princess Elizabeth Land, which is a bit of a red hot spot for research. 20 years later, they had uh, the second most southern station of any nation at the highest and coldest point on the continent, that's Kunlun. And you probably remember me pointing out there that dome Argus point, which is around about 80 south. 2014, five years after that, they had established an intermediate staging base between Kunlun and the coastline called Taishan. And obviously that enabled them to uh, repeatedly access Kunlun, given it's such a, a significant distance. Now the next few years then demonstrate their resolve by acquiring their own intracontinental airlift, uh, they own the aeroplane, they don't operate it, a company called Ken Borok from Canada do. They also looked at a new maritime logistics option with their icebreaker. And they're now looking at ways to enter the intercontinental aviation playing field. I think you get the idea. Of course, all this time we continued out of our 1950s vintage stations, plotted along with, with minor upgrades, um, noting we had significant gains with the establishment of intercontinental aviation in 2007 through Wilkins Field. The writing was on the wall, uh, so our government got active and laid out the 20 year plan in April of 2016. Now, I accept that you in the audience have lots of reading in the PMA space right now, but if there is a document you should read to explain our Antarctic strategy in Australian perspective, spend 20 minutes having a quick read of this one and all will be revealed was launched in April of 2016 by the current Prime Minister, and it talked about a major whole of government commitment. Uh, of course, us being a significant part, being the ADF with our niche capabilities. Key themes of that was Australia is a leading uh, Antarctic nation, so that maintaining that seat at the table, support for the Antarctic treaty system to keep that particular program intact, revitalizing the Antarctic science program and we'll talk about a little bit later about major projects in that area provide modern and flexible infrastructure which needs a refresh and picking up Tasmania as an Antarctic gateway so obviously the double edge there is obviously we gain economic benefits uh, with growth to our major southern state so this was all supported with 2.2 billion dollars of funding now, most of that got wrapped up in the icebreaker ice construction and sustained the cost for that. But there are a significant infrastructure revamps also included. Now, this document actually laid the foundations to our current contribution to the whole of government strategy through off Southern Discovery. So now you have the background, let's have a quick look at the, the physical. Um, <clears throat> 
And uh, hopefully it all makes sense why we are there, but you need to understand a little bit about the actual the, the, the state of play and what we're actually playing with. First thing we need to discuss is what we're actually dealing with in the AO. And the first thing is the actual the size of the AO. So the first thing that I always strikes me is how we reflect on proportions down there. So if you look at this first map of Antarctica, that's that tiny little bit of white stuff down the very, very bottom. Okay, so you've got the world, all very colourful, obviously, but it really doesn't look significant. Then you go to another extreme, which is this one, where it looks like it's half the world, and this is the way that the map is projected. And of course, then you've got something like this, which shows it from a different view from the bottom, uh, giving a bit more proportion to actually what the size of the continent is. I think one of the first maps that show exactly what we're dealing with is this one here, which this over, over pretty much shows Australia, um, the, the, the coastline of Australia, uh, superimposed over the continent itself. Something you really need to get your head around in this AO is distance. And you can see Casey and you can see Davis. So that's actually the distance of Melbourne to Brisbane in magnitude with nothing else in between, just lots of ice and lots of snow. The other thing is there, Casey to Mawson. You can see Casey and you can see Mawson up there in Kepland. Well, that's about the distance of Townsville to Darwin with nothing else in between. Now, well, between Townsville and Darwin, currently there isn't much in between. However, uh, we're talking about nothing out there at the moment, down, down on the continent. Next thing I understand is the shape from summer to winter. So normally you'll be provided with an image that covers that gray area. That's what everyone traditionally understands of Antarctica. But during the peak of winter, you actually got a large sea ice area surrounding the continent, which makes it pretty much an impermeable uh, barrier. Now icebreakers can't smash through anything. Anyone who thinks that's true, needs completely off the boil. They hit their limit at around about 1.6 metres of thickness, depending on the size of the icebreaker weight and the like. <clears throat> but uh, as you can see, there are significant differences or issues trying to operate down there during the winter time to actually access the continent as opposed to the summertime. Now, some of the some of the real expanses there are, are actual distances from Australia in terms of uh, flight time and sailing. Now, talk in talk about Hobart to Casey. That's an eight-day boat trip in good conditions. Hobart to Davis, that's a 10-day boat trip. Hobart to Mawson, 12 days. Now, in terms of intercontinental aviation, which has real be, really been uh, one of the significant um, uh, boosters that the AAD have, have received from us during the last two years, we're now looking at around about four and a half hours to go from Hobart to Wilkins Airfield, just down the road from Casey. So obviously there's quite significant differences there in, um, in time frame, uh, but more importantly, you can see what we can offer with the C-17 in doing that. Now, you should all by now have a bit of a, an understanding of the physical dimensions of the area of operations and the distance required to actually access them. <clears throat> we'll have a look at some of the other elements that we have to deal with down there. First thing, of, of course, is weather, which is our friend. Every location, every operating theatre has its own specific weather. I'm not going to argue about that. Um, and it varies in intensities for some locations. Some are predictable, some are not. Antarctica is no different. But unfortunately, the accuracy of long cast forecasting and the onset of localised weather effects are the most difficult issue to deal to handle. Weather forecasting to support intercontinental aviation only becomes really quite tight in terms of predictability in the final 24 hours prior to the mission. It's unlike frontal weather you see here in Australia, in particular in the southern states. Now, blizzards and random weather conditions are an assumed fact of life down there. But onset is very difficult to manage. And we have, if we have conditions like this in other operating theatres, usually we can bunker down and shelter somewhere and sort ourselves out. But imagine you're halfway through unloading some sort of cargo off a flatbed Mac somewhere, and this weather sort of comes along with really little or no notice. Obviously, it can be quite cruelly. Just to keep the stations up and going, if there is a problem at a remote building on station, such as a generator room, and you can expect that's pretty important, getting out there to manage the issue can be an effort in itself. Often it's by the use of rope lines uh, and to connect between the buildings to enable that transit. Now, weather like this and a lot less intense that hits our intra-Antarctic air operations piece hard, 
for instance, in the season just gone, we had a, a project called the Ice Cap Science Research Program project. In two months of air asset assigned, so we had a Basla, which is a DC3 assigned for two months, we only got 10 flights achieved purely based on weather. You can see how that might be uh, an issue for continuation of the program. The same issues are experienced with our C17 as well. So what is it? So, so what is it that if a drop or ice of snow makes its way on the control surfaces of a C-17, depending on the severity, the aircraft might not be going anywhere due to control surface binding. It's something that the crews are very, very cognizant of when they operate down there. Weather and ice states also have a massive, a massive effect on our ability to load and unload uh, the ships or any sort of marine cargo, uh, which we get into in a little moment. What more? Uh, blizzards like this create extreme hazards in just a day-to-day -day functioning of keeping the station upright, as I mentioned before. Now, by land, crossing the expanse of ice or traversing um, is very difficult. There's no motorway, there's no roads. Uh, GPS plus radar is good, but uh, need to stick to minimum risk routes to avoid uh, falling into crevasse. What we would look at a one hour trip down the road on an established line of communication is a 12 hour uh, journey uh, in this theatre with probably two weeks of planning in the lead up plus the meteorology, meteorological forecasting uh, assigned to it. Crevasses are a uh, inherent risk of, um, of operating down there constantly. Now, I'm sure there are other situations where we've got other threats and other theatres that we have to worry about which can ruin our day. A key part of this, though, as a convoy commander, is you've got to come up with those options of whether you have to leave something behind or continue on. And if you've got critical pieces of equipment in that particular load, that can make the decision-making space quite fuzzy. In actual fact, if you have to make a decision to actually recover the equipment, you're on your own with just the equipment you're carrying and the people you have in the convoy. These things aren't small in, in size and can swallow vehicles whole. So it's an ongoing risk they have to deal with in overland traverse. In the same same, it affects aviation. Some of you may or may not be aware, in January 2016, um, we had a, uh, a contracted helicopter pilot step out of his helicopter uh, in Antarctica and fall down a crevasse. Unfortunately, um, Mr Wood lost his life. But uh, these hazards are ongoing and uh, can't be seen and are well disguised in the environment. Now, whilst massive sheets of ice create hazards in one sense, they provide a strong, sturdy platform in another. Now, this is our 3,500 metre long runway at Wilkins, used for direct intercontinental, intercontinental aviation using A319, not unlike you'd fly on Jetstar to, to Gold Coast and for the C-17. Now, this runway allows for use of wheeled aircraft, but we also operate in an intracontinental uh, context on skiways for the smaller aircraft. Of course, when conducting an aviation-based logistic mission, uh, the weather needs to be good at both locations, both the departure and the arrival. Unlike airports in Australia, where you might have a precision approach to get you low in bad weather, you don't have that option down here in the continent. That's why weather support to aviation operations is so critical. The other part, obviously, is actual maintenance and preparation of the runway. Extremely resource intensive. And it's not a case of prepare it and there we go for five months. Or in the context of Australia, go to any of those, any airport, you've got uh, 8,000 foot of concrete and bitumen and the thing looks after itself. Every time the runway is used on the continent at Wilkins, there is an eight hour a period of snow clearance provide, uh, followed by laser surveys to ensure integrity. Depending on the extremity of that weather that might preclude or predate uh, any of those operations will di 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 dictate the amount of effort required to produce a usable product. More snow, more preparation. Initial preparations after winter in the order of six weeks to at least to get uh, the facility ready for use. Skiways need a little bit less effort but effort nonetheless to shore a suitably level platform. Now there's no port as such. <clears throat> the wharf is actually made of ice in a lot of cases, or we're using other means. 
So the wharf actually can disappear, or maybe even more inconveniently, not thick enough to support the weight of any of our cargo material handling equipment. If it's not thick enough, then we rely on barges, uh, which you can see top right there, or in actual fact, uh, larks, as you would all be accustomed to. But ice may still be thick enough not to clear to enable barge operations. You can see how this can turn into a lose-lose situation very quickly. Of course, resupply voyages are planned to give the best chance to avoid a situation like this, and very much dictated on the time of the year. Another killer is we can conduct our transfer of fuel oil, diesel, which is the lifeblood of obviously most of the stations, over the ice and via hose. And depending on the condition of the ice as a platform to host the hose will depend on the technique used. Sometimes the hose is actually floated in the water, as you can see in the picture in the bottom right. Obviously, environment impacts of not getting this right is of significant concern. <clears throat> of course, outside of those logistics impacts of operating down there to enable the operations and to enable the science, um, operations in areas like hydrography can also be affected by the existence of sea ice, which can completely shut down a, a sequence of scientific work. Just this year in Horseshoe Harbour, which is adjacent to Mawson, the ice was thick enough to cause problems for Aurora Australis to get in to unload its cargo, and then also was such that it prevented a lot of the hydrography operations being conducted in a timely manner. Most of it got completed, but still a hindrance nonetheless. <clears throat> you can see in a situation like this, and this is not one of our vessels, but uh, using this technique to load it, unload onto an ice shelf in any sort of sea state would become quite problematic. Let's have a quick talk now about the means of how we get things done down there. <clears throat> Obviously, there's a wide variety of vehicles, and just like any other theatre uh, and any other vehicles that we have in the ADF, uh, obviously got a bus there. Yes, the tyres are oversized to deal with the snow, um, and it's completely um, it's it's built such that uh, it can stand the extremes of weather. Obviously, we have quad track uh, loaders, earth movers, as you'd see on any other construction site. We have uh, four wheeler quad bikes, which is common uh, common use across the ADF. And in addition, we also use uh, track Antarctic people movers like these Haglands. Now, they're built for the Swedish Army, but the company now is under BAA. And the Australian Antarctic Division actually refurbish and maintain these vehicles at depot level. Now, aviation is very much the lifeblood of keeping operations going. So, of course, we use AS350 uh, helicopters under contract through helicopter resources down here. Uh, they can sling around about a tonne and are very convenient in being able to uh, land on almost any sort of uh, situation. Uh, we also operate Twin Otters and uh, Basler, so the Twin Otter is top right and Basler bottom right, uh, through Ken Boric Aviation out of Canada. So the kind of weights they can carry is around about the two tonnes to three tonnes for the Basler. Now all these obviously, as I said, contracted through an aviation specialist, and we don't actually provide as an ADF any of the intra uh, continental aviation capability. We do, though, um, the, or the Australian Antarctic Division, through a quid pro quo system, uh, utilise some of the op deep freeze LC-130 assets um, to uh, carry larger cargo. So they can take around about 30,000 pounds, but require a well-groomed skiway. So you can see that in the bottom left. Again, all the operations in aviation, very, very sensitive to weather. In terms of intercontinental aviation, like I mentioned before, we've got a 35-seat A319 aircraft with long-range tanks, which flies out of Hobart, Director Wilkins. That's the primary people mover. And obviously with C-17, enough said on its capabilities, you should all well be aware of those. Uh, it's currently product, um, using uh, to carry oversized cargo uh, to and from uh, Hobart to Wilkins in return. Uh, currently, it's actually the material handling equipment on the ice that is the limiting factor. In a lot of cases, we are forcing a fire hose down a garden hose when it gets down to, down to the ice. Now, in terms of aviation, you will note from previous slides the disposition of all those stations, which reflects the broad areas from where science is focused. 
Uh, in the intercontinental aviation piece, there are obviously limited wheeled runways, and you can see them all here uh, shown as green dots on this map. You already know about ours at Wilkins, which is around about the four o'clock, and you can see the United States and New Zealand runway Phoenix down there at McMurdo at six o'clock. Now, the next closest in East Antarctica sits up at 12 o'clock. In terms of strategy, and we're talking about that area around Davis Station called Princess Elizabeth Land, in terms of strategy, a country that was to build an all-seasons runway at around that point would hold significant strategic power in the Antarctic Treaty Centre. It's for this reason that we are heavily investing in, in, in a year-round aviation access capability on, in that particular area, and that work is currently underway. In terms of maritime options, uh, obviously this is Australian, or, sorry, Aurora Australis, uh, Australian-made vessel in came out of Newcastle in the late 80s, can carry 116 people and uh, cargo, but struggles to meet the demand of an ever-increasing scientific program, along with a modernisation program that's fallen out of the 2016 doctrine. It does have limited science research capability, most of that being conducted en route between Hobart and the continent. One of the problems though is age is reducing its capacity significantly. Luckily for us, already under build in Romania is this, Nuina, which significantly upsized in cargo capacity, which we'll talk about in a sec, and also a floating science lab with multi-beam hydrographic capabilities, and uh, which may see Navy personnel attached in the future. In terms of the chalk and cheese of the two vessels, you've got uh, Nuina on the left, Soror Australis on the right. You're looking at around about a 50% extra cargo and fuel capacity for Nuina, and three times the container and hold space. In addition, you've got those extra capabilities of the floating science concepts. So moving uh, moving equipment and personnel long distances over land on the continent is a challenge, and uh, getting them there by sea can be hard, just like I said, those eight, 10, and 12 day voyages. Now, Traverse is one of the next big pieces of the puzzle. Now, if we were to do something in Australia to move large amounts of cargo over land, we'd probably use this. I apologise for the lack of one-to-one -one phase three B vehicles in there. I couldn't find any file footage. Um, however, this is how we've done it in recent past in Australia, in Australian terms. And this was with the assistance of the French. Uh, we used this for our last Aurora Basin uh, ice, uh, ice core drilling um, project. Now, um, that's how we've done it in a smaller way. The Chinese do like uh, of course, that's very much a uh, more of a media show-off type photo more than anything. However, it's this kind of effort that's required to establish deep field camps or forward operating bases, I guess, for want of a better term. They're in, hence, in essence an enabler to enable those pinnacles of Antarctic science to be met. So some of the questions you should ask yourself as a forum is how would we as an ADF support the Australian Antarctic program in this space with our niche capabilities? Now these traverse missions obviously need fuel to keep the system going. So is deep field aerial delivery of fuel, perhaps noting the risks attached uh, or attached with that type of operation, um, how, how can we make that contribution? Is it viable? Uh, are there better ways to do it? Now we've already done some deep field uh, aerial delivery of fuel. We did that to Bunga Hills. Um, in very recent uh, history, back in the previous season, uh, to establish a fuel depot there for aviation. Now, rather than using the Basler, which is that uh, DC-3 looking aircraft and Twin Otter, um, which is obviously resource intensive, uh, we saved uh, about 30 missions by using one C-17A uh, airdrop and saved a minimum of 18 days of work. So the math is quite, quite easy in that regard. Now, is this feasible? Uh, to move to the same sort of, or get the same sort of effect to supply a traverse type operation. We've also successfully conducted a food and equipment drop uh, resupply to Davis in the last season just gone to top up uh, the capability gap in Aurora Australis and what it could carry to the start of the season. Just, just concluding and, and wrapping up, one of the previous, one of the key things you need to understand about this AO is the KPIs, and it's all about science. So operations support the conduct of science. Uh, we are there to produce science outputs. 
Now, with the exception of tourism in Antarctica, which is a separate, separate little area, no one really goes there for a four-month holiday, and no one goes to Bali for that long either. The key principle is that science is the currency of the continent, which is a fundamental which needs to be understood at the, at the very last level. Things like krill capture, krill being um, small marine life, and ice core sampling and, and carriage is the kind of thing that will get science flock, scientists flocking to Hobart to do further research in that area. So if you get a chance to read that 20 year action plan, you'll note that there's two major scientific focuses. The first one is the million year ice core. Now we consider this to be the holy grail of Antarctic science. It provides a picture of climate that will almost explain everything. The million year ice core will relay us information around about the time that the change in ice course, age to ice age cycles went from about 30,000 years to 100,000 years. Ice cores, in addition though, have a half-life, believe it or not, just like uh, uranium, I guess, and getting those cores to the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Science here in Hobart within a timely manner, and that being in the 32 to 38 hours type time, time frame, makes a significant difference to the scientific output. So that's where things like the C-17 can make a contribution and bring those samples back. The, the 10, 8, 10 or 12 day uh, sea voyage is probably not gonna cut it. The other aspect is in krill research. So krill are a perfect means to analyze the ecosystem of the ocean to determine what is happening, what they eat, who eats them, how many are being consumed or fished in the surrounding marine waters as a human food source. Now, we also have the capability with C-17 to have krill fitted in an IBC, they're delivered to Hobart within six to seven hours after they pull from the ocean. Now, that really changes the playing field from a 60% attrition rate on a 10 day voyage back to Hobart to around about a one to 2% attrition rate due to the journey times. Now, in terms of science, this is an unheard concept in any other nation. However, scientists will flock to Hobart to observe this type of uh, live um, experimentation, and they see it as liquid gold. It all adds up to what the AAD actually provides to meet the requirements of the AAP displayed here. And those are the national interests pursued through the program, uh, operate and maintaining those research stations, the shipping and the logistics network, the world-class scientific program, and that policy and diplomacy with DFAT to uphold the treaty system. That pretty much concludes my presentation today, so I'm quite happy to take any questions that might come along, Claire. Okay, so the first question comes from Holsworthy, and it says, "Do you please could, could you please provide some insight into the new, unique logistic requirements and challenges of operating in Antarctica, which I think you've done some of already? Following on from that, does TFSB need to revamp or re-establish its use of amphibious craft to support Anare? I'm pretty sure any increase in capability required of TMSB would come through the Director of Land Operations. Uh, everything we do comes through JOC. But of not, we are uh, entering into a, an area of subject matter expert exchanges in LARC operations and maintenance. So the Antarctic Division op obviously operate LARCs, which are being used to own, funnily enough. Um, but maintaining that key uh, subject matter expert and an exchange of ideas in how best to maintain uh, the larks and how to operate them in different areas um, would be a benefit to both uh, organisations. So that is coming, uh, hopefully during this off, uh, off out of ASP season over the winter. I hope that, does that answer his question? I, I hope so it does. So. He, he can email me if he uh, needs <laughs> to get any further explanation on that. Excellent, so the second question comes from here in Hobart. Can you expand on the development of a second airfield or air point of embarkation, air point of entry you mentioned earlier? Yep, so currently um, we've got uh, some young sappers who have done some work down there the last couple of seasons um, in looking at the viability. So this process isn't something you do overnight. The first thing is to identify a key area to do it. Now the area around Davis um, wasn't really mentioned during the lecture, but is one of the few ice-free areas on the continent, which means that uh, pretty much you can build the foundations of any airfield on rock. Um, as a part of that, there's been several areas uh, investigated in the area around Davis to see, look at the viability of building a runway. Now, after that, obviously, it'll go to an infrastructure decision with government. Are we going to commit to this area? 
you know, it's viable or it's not viable, are we going to commit to it? And then it will go through into a, uh, a development and finally a construction phase at end state. Uh, look, it, it's a few years away yet, but obviously you need to do the background research before you start. Okay, so next question. How solid do you think the Antarctic treaty system is? Are there threats to the treaty's continued existence? Uh, good point. And you know what? I'm not an expert uh, in that area. Um, certainly uh, GM Strategies uh, at the Australian Antarctic Division is an expert. Um, everything I've seen of to date indicates it is quite strong, but uh, that continued uh, building of scientific credibility is a key factor to, to maintaining it. And also having everyone, I mean, I think the Chinese, they, they do a fair bit of uh, science. In fact, they do a lot of science and they collaborate with us. So it, it, everyone's a very much a happy camper down there, uh, but it's it's a continued discussion and working through it. I, I don't I don't see it being at any sort of risk at the moment, but again, I'm not an expert. GM Strategies at AAD is the expert in that area. We just provide the service to the program. Fantastic, thanks, sir. The last question, sir. Obviously, ADF support helps the Australian Antarctic program. What benefits do we get from our participation in Ops Southern Discovery? That's a good point. Um, look, we, uh, I guess we get we get skill sets at working in environments outside the norm is one. Uh, and we've already done that through some of the work that our logisticians from JOC have engaged in a, a subject matter expert exchange program. Now, we're also getting uh, some Antarctic or cold weather extreme condition survival uh, training out of that. We just sent, recently sent two army members and the previous season we sent uh, two survival training, uh, training personnel to get a little bit more, better understanding of how to do survival training in that environment. Um, we, we do also get obviously a fair bit of corporate knowledge in operating in these conditions. So for our C-17 crews, See, they're getting the capability, if they can land at Wilkins, they can obviously go to other ice runways and operate there. So gaining that corporate knowledge across the board is, is very good. Um, in terms of, um, I, it's really just exposure to those conditions and the corporate knowledge we gain. But at the end of the day, um, the CDF obviously entered into this operation in providing a uh, ADF contribution to a whole of government operation. So we're just providing those niche capabilities that we already have. So, and this one last one that's just come through. Mm -hmm. How does a member of the ADF get selected to be involved in the Australian Antarctic Division? Ah, nice work. <laughs> right, so uh, the current policy that applies is you can either be selected as part of a force element from an existing ADF capability. If you so desire to go down and work uh, outside of the ADF, you, you can, um, as many members of the ADF do, apply and go through the selection system. The, re the question of release from your service is one question, and I'll leave that to individuals to have that discussion with their career manners. Um, but then the next one is, um, if you, in terms of trying to be force assigned as an individual, that's, a, that's an answer that uh, CJOPS will provide to you, uh, given uh, consideration of whether it's a niche capability or not. But by all means, if, if people wish to spend some time outside of their um, ADF service, um, there's two ways. You're either on the books or off the books, I guess. But um, the Director of Personnel at JOC can provide further explanation on how that all works. Yep. Any comments? No, I've got nothing else unless people have any more questions. I'm clear. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. On behalf of the COVE team, and everybody that attended across the country, um, it was an outstanding presentation. We thank you very much. I've got no doubt, no doubt there'll be a lot of discussion in various places across the country after this presentation. And we really appreciate the time and effort you put into preparing that presentation. Ladies and gents, um, thanks for your attendance today. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback about the presentation and any other ideas that you might have. So feel free to email us at soldiercove at gmail.com or follow the links to contribute to the Cove on the website.